Hello and welcome everyone. This is Minhaj, CEO of CIDA, um, an academic and industrial research company. And today I have with me um, a very dear friend of mine, um, Dr. Alex Christensen, with um, his research on personality psychology. We'll be talking about a lot of things, including how to measure that. Um, biological basis of that, his own research on openness and humor um, and fMRIs and a lot of things. Welcome, Dr. Alexander. Thanks for having me, Minaj. It's a pleasure. I'm excited to talk. Yes. And, you know, it's not every day that I get to enjoy this sadistic pleasure in inviting someone um, to get to answer questions that people usually ask me. So I'm very happy that now today you have the bullseye on your back and I'm not going to be the one <laughs> answering the skepticism that people have about personality psychology. So if I may play the devil's advocate, um, what is this pop psychology that you have been teaching people? <laughs> oh man. So I think personality has come a long way from where pop psychology, I think, has put it. So I think it really, you know, as we've talked about, it really dates back um, thousands uh, of years. And I think really at this point, um, where the real scientific concrete evidence has really only dated for about 50 to 100 years. And so for personality psychology, I think there's a flavor of pop psychology to it, I think, because everyone has like an intuitive understanding of what personality is. We all have one. We all know other people and we all know that they have certain personalities. And so I think where the science starts to differ or at least moves away from the popular science is where, as you, as you were saying, we're looking for biological basises and we're uh, really constructing and trying to measure these things as accurate as possible using sophisticated survey methods and sophisticated statistical methods. So uh, to that, I would say we've, we've really moved it along and moved the needle more towards the science and away from, I think, our day-to-day -day anecdotal experiences. Okay. Now, there has been a certain phenomenon in psychology, um, and bear with me because I have terrible... Um, talents when it comes to remembering names, but what it says is that people generally believe the theories or descriptions of their personality as long as they're very balanced and you know that fits everyone in some region and that paints them in a picture which is very positive. So the people have the tendency to believe things um, that are very mild and doesn't really help. Now, when you talk about personality and I talk about personality, how do we actually quantitatively establish that the descriptions uh, of personality are actually the real depictions of social expressions in society and which is quantifiable? How do you actually establish that? So that's a really good question. And I think it starts with you know, when it when it comes to, as you're saying, with the descriptions, people can really see themselves in those whichever kind of descriptions you give them. And I think part of that is just due to the variability of who we are. Um, while we have very stable traits, we can think of times or instances where we're more talkative or where we're less talkative. And so because of that, you know, when we're given a description, well, it seems like you're talkative most of the time. Even if you're not very talkative, you can say, well, I can really think of instances where I'm that, so that must be correct, or I have an intuitive sense that that's correct. Now, what we uh, try to do, or what, what we're doing is, we're giving you questionnaires that kind of force you to say, I mostly agree with this, or I strongly disagree with this. And it's this kind of measurement process that we're able to, uh, I think, get at more what people are like most of the time. And so it kind of gets rid of these um, more nuanced or um, kind of anecdotal examples of when I've been like this or when I've been like that. And we're able to measure how you are most of the time. And uh, our evidence kind of bears that out. When we ask people these questions day to day, um, people may not remember what they've said, um, but these ultimately end up lining up 
with the personality traits, uh, their levels of the personality traits that we see um, between people. So an important part to that is personality is relative in terms of how we measure, measure it mostly. We're usually looking at um, comparing you to other people. And so it's kind of that that gives us some leverage to say, well, you're, you tend to be more talkative than others or less talkative. <laughs> Well, that's a very interesting definition of how do we actually pinhole us depending on the comparison between other people, which makes us, I guess, um, a product of cross comparison with others. But um, what I wanted to get into is a little bit of um, historical evidence from the history of um, psychology, psychiatry, social psychology, anthropology, where we have interpretation of, interpretation of dreams by Freud, in which he talks a lot about um, not only the biological basis of uh, development of personality, as well as some of the fiction um, and not so savory things. Um, and then we have a tradition from Carl Jung, where he talks a more about uh, the totems and uh, spiritual artifacts, um, the hero, the anima, and um, other things that are not quantifiable in, in, for, for many scientists and researchers. And that's exactly um, one of the most influential um, psychologists in the history of the field, Eisenach, pointed out that as long as you cannot measure um, what's out there quantitatively and make sure that it's replicable and valid, it is pop psychology. And no matter what um, anyone says, it should not be the domain of science. Um, the subsequent developments in behavioralism and um, cognitive um, behavioral therapy, um, even psychoanalysis has told us that there certainly is um, a usage or utility of, um, of counseling of a verbal psychology, a description of uh, personality like we do in, in clinical tests like uh, Minnesota multiphasic inventory, which is used in clinical um, assessments. So what's your take on um, these two approaches? Uh, one that involves um, quantitative um, measurement of personality um, through valid established questionnaires and then cross compare it um, and rank it um, with age and geography. And then there's another approach which depends more on descriptive um, description of um, a person's state or emotion or outburst or clinical history. Um, so, so where do you see the balance in these two? Yeah, that's, that's a really, it's a really tough question, I think, to to really give. We could we could talk all, all day about this, I think. But you know where I fall, and I think this is maybe my bias, just in the training and the type of research I do. I definitely fall more on the side of the quantitative side, and using models and using statistics to really get at and answer these questions. But I think, as you're, I think, uh, alluding to here a little bit, is that they really can inform each other. Um, we can have these mathematical models, and we can have um, these quantitative approaches, but if they don't reflect what's actually happening, which is often given by some of these more descriptive things that we see in like uh, clinical interviews um, or outcomes in people's lives, that if that that's not matching up, then we then we have a problem here. So I definitely fall more on the side of, of starting first with a strong quantitative base, just making sure we know what we're, we're measuring. And then, you know, making sure that, that those measures then line up with uh, the, the qualitative outcomes that we see, uh, the descriptive outcomes that we're seeing, whether it be um, in clinical practice or whether it be, you know, in kind of more of like an applied job uh, IO psych or in industrial organization psych, where people uh, based on their personality maybe fit into certain career paths. And again, these like, rely on kind of that descriptive side of things. Well, let's pick up um, the strand with the quantitative methods um, first and talk about how do we actually establish 
um, those methods so that there is no built-in bias in that. Now, uh, a brief um, historical overview um, of that and the rules are established by um, more cognitive oriented scientists like Eisenach himself, um, where he has um, his own personality inventory and he focuses only um, two aspects of that, which are easily discernible, which is neuroticism, I believe, but I think the other one is the introversion and extroversion. Now his take is that um, these are the things that can be quantitatively established, especially neuroticism when you use experiments that measures the vital signs um, of a human being when they're put under um, a, a stress factor. For example, we can use the skin conductance test, we can use the sensitivity to light, we could also use um, respiration rate, uh, we could give them different experiences of dread and disgust um, and anger um, and making them feel uncomfortable and see their reactions and then stack them up um, with each other to see who are the people who react more negatively to a stimulus. Now that's something that you can establish and then we have solid proofs that um, reaction times and um, other experiments from other multidisciplinary fields that you know that's something that you can measure. But then there are other things that are hard to measure and the description kind of confounds with other constructs like agreeableness. And so if you're a kind person, now well, that is a statement, but then kind itself is a relative uh, adjective. Now you're kind in comparison with who? Like, do you have to rank it between one to 10 or are you more kinder um, in your own environment or your definition of kindness? There's a lot of subjectivity that comes into it. And then we have cattle inventory, then we have big five and we've got MBTI. How do you actually quantitatively establish that? So what are some of the methods that we can use to establish that? No, I think I think you started. I think you started with the core of it with Eisnick there with um, the, the neuroticism and extroversion, introversion. Um, this was really a great place to start because these are things that all people really express. We we really see that all people um, have some level of of tendency towards um, uh, like positive affect or positive reward with extroversion. Kind of the approach. Um, is kind of a more general term that's used is approaching reward or approaching stimulus. And then you have neuroticism, which is um, moving away from um, or distancing yourself from some um, either environment or context. And I think establishing that first was a really strong point for personality psychology, because what it established it in is, is it established it in biological basis is right away. So I think that was a really key point for then further development of what we see today as the big five. And to go back actually to what you were talking about with some of the descriptive uh, pieces, um, there is actually another line of research uh, if, if early in personality that started with the, the lexical hypothesis, which is where we get a lot of the, the big five today. Um, and that was really just giving people adjectives. I mean, I think, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but it was tens of thousands of adjectives that um, were given to, to people and people would rate how they um, see themselves on these adjectives and then using um, statistical quantitative methods, uh, common things are like factor models, which reduce uh, the information from these 10,000 adjectives down to, for example, like 16 dimensions like a tell scale where you have um, kind of more uh, broad characteristics that describe personality. And it was really um, from that line um, that Eisenach's work and this uh, more descriptive work kind of merged and kind of came into the big five that we have today, um, which is the, the openness to experience, conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, and, and extroversion, of course. Now, well, the marriage of both of um, these methods seem very unlikely um, in the sense that uh, people who have advocated for that um, have been very vocal um, 
and sometimes in not a very polite way, especially Eisenach um, called everyone else who believed in psychotherapy a quack. Um, and I think that's a, quite a big um, allegation, especially if you look at the history of um, psychiatric quantitative uh, medicine or um, surgeries. We have absolutely um, horrible examples of prefrontal lobotomy. Um, and um, that's one of my favorite topics, actually, to discuss students in intro to psych class um, when you show them um, open skulls and, you know, how people used to do that. And then we had a, had a lot of gender discrimination in uh, Middle Ages where uh, menstrual cycles were deemed to be a demon, demonic uh, phenomena um, labeled as female hysteria. So a lot of these things do originate from um, psychiatry and quantitative uh, medicine and therapy. So when people talk about pure descriptive research, they do have a point that, um, you know, why should we follow this tradition? And then when, when you talk about finally the convergence of these two, um, it seems very surprising. However, the fact is that um, recent research has shown in huge samples um, in multicultural, uh, multi-gender, multi-country um, samples that the personality descriptions have not only um, st stood the test of time, but they have been very accurate in many respects. And it has huge correlations with lifetime achievements and outcomes like academic performance, uh, political choice, liberalism, conservatism, voting behaviors and patterns, and there's a swath of literature that um, originates with these uh, personality differences. How do you actually see these developments and wh where does the genius of um, coming up with the quantitative method, which is so accurate, originate from? Yeah, so this this goes um, kind of really back to, to Spearman um, and, and Thurstone, who um, really kind of founded this factor analysis of really looking at the patterns in the data. So it is a bit more of an, an empirical or evidence-based approach where based on how different characteristics of people are associating, um, we can kind of then further summarize and say that you know these characteristics summarize into um you know a trait like anxiety which is also related to another characteristic like depression um as well as like anger and hostility so it then kind of then further collapses down into just negative emotions um, which we would maybe just call neuroticism and so where where it really comes from is just kind of this um this summarizing of the associations between patterns and the data. And, you know, I, I, I'm still amazed at how successful these approaches are, um, just in the way that they can take a lot of information, um, hundreds, if not thousands of variables and condense and summarize them to a point that we then get to predicting certain things like life outcomes. It could be uh, like health outcomes, mental health outcomes, physical outcomes. As you were saying, um, for, for openness to experience, that's very related to political views. Um, and then you have extroversion, which is, I think, a very interesting moderator in uh, lifetime achievement. Um, there's some good examples for artists, for example, that um, the more extroverted artists are, the better they tend to do. Um, and this is just because of their, their networking. Um, are, and, and networking in general um, is a very positive thing, I think now, especially in this interconnected world. And so we can really see how um, when we get from these models that are then summarizing these data points into these uh, kind of broad general characteristics, that uh, they then lead to predictive outcomes that are meaningful uh, to people's lives. And I know, um, as we've talked about, you've been using these in a very meaningful way in some of the work that you've been doing. Um, 
One of the things that, that is so aspiring um, and fascinating to me, um, especially um, in my line of work in, in which we have collaborated also, is the ability of these instruments to, let's say, objectively place human beings on a spectrum from low to high expressions of certain traits. So what we used to do uh, in medieval times, or even until very recent um, history, uh, we labeled people as sick, mentally sick, or not sick, or normal, and which is a very loose definition of how people can be placed into different pegs. Um, so we have MMPI, which gives us different scoring like six, eight or eight, six models. And then you have descriptions for a certain personality score. And then, you know, if that matches with the person's, person's life, you know, they have put that in this category. A new approach is, however, is um, using a spectrum of adaptive and maladaptive behaviors that can occur or co-occur at any point in life um, due to a lot of um, unforeseeable reasons. And then help them out in identifying those behaviors that can be corrected. So this, this U-turn towards a more holistic, um, encouraging and supportive narrative, how did we actually take this turn? Yeah, that's a good question that I, you know, I'm not sure I have a, a very solid answer to actually. This is, this is one that I think um, that I'm going to have to concede that um, I don't know too much about of how we really got there. I think part of it just stems from the objectivity of science and trying to really be objective about the way in which we're classifying people. I think our classifications have such a strong influence on decisions on people's lives that um, we really need to be as objective as possible about it and really removing that subjectivity. Um, otherwise, we're left with decisions that um, are, are really unfair. And, you know, I think some of the, the criterion can still be unfair to certain groups of people um, and, and stuff like that. But I think, you know, we've advanced it to at least be able to say with with certainty that, you know, we, we can objectively measure personality and put people on the spectrum that we can then say, if you're an, at an extreme end of this, you're more likely to, for example, have or develop a certain personality disorder. Um, and there, which then helps kind of target, you know, certain aspects of, of people's life that we maybe need to work on or change. So I think it was really just the objectification and really putting down the, the really making it a science um, that got us there. Um, I think you are also um, on the board of a peer review board of some journals and you're very familiar with AP and its structure. And in recent times, there have been significant criticisms on um, how APA um, manuals, um, especially DSM-5, um, categorizes people into different um, categories and bags. And uh, it's just like one size fits all um, solution out of the bag that's available for everyone. And then it doesn't really stop there. So you have to have additional medicines for that. And one of the dilemmas that uh, we've talked earlier about is that at least in the US, there are a lot of mental health challenges and a lot less qualified people to take care of that. Uh, which is um, which leaves a lot of people without any help. If you look at this um, visualization, um, I, I, there's a fantastic visualization by um, University of Washington. Let's see if I can actually pull that for you. Um, th there's a significant correlation between um, a country's GDP, modernity, and um, mental health issues. Um, because people in uh, more underdeveloped societies somehow do not have this. And I'm just curious what makes it uh, the way it is. So if I'm actually share uh, this screen with you, just give me a minute. 
no problem. Do you mind if I take a stab at, at that question? Well, oh, perfect. You got it up already. Sure. So if you look at this visualization, it's a stunning uh, piece of work. Um, and if you look at this um, psychological diseases um, on the bottom, and if you just rank it by, let's say, um, low social development index countries, um, you see, it becomes so small, um, the share of that. But if you just go back to countries, which are supposedly um, a little bit better than others, just look at the size of you know, psychological uh, problems that people have. And I was just wondering if there's a correlation between um, material wealth and um, the um, psychological aspect of um, well, let's say coping up with um, changing economic situations. Yeah, I, I have a lot of opinions here, so I'll, I'll add that disclaimer. Um, but I do think there is some evidence to suggest that, you know, it, for these more materialistic, more um, GDP economic driven countries, it becomes, it, it you know, I would argue that it becomes more about profit than the people. And so, and I think that also gets instilled in our values where we start putting money as the, you know, money as kind of the benchmark for happiness rather than valuing other things like personal interactions and um, finding meaning and fulfill, uh, fulfillment in other aspects of life. And so I, I do think that there is a strong struggle in um, higher GDP countries because of this. And I mean, one of the things that I, that I am very vocal about, although I'm guilty of myself, is just the number of hours that people work. And we, for example, in the United States, it's, it's not unheard of to work 50 hours a week um, when you know, a, a full-time job is considered 40 hours a week. And it's not unheard of to work 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week, and somehow that's become that's become a norm. And I think on the other side of that, you also have the discrepancy of wages, where you have a low minimum wage where people need to work two, three jobs to just make make a living and and really put food on the table. When you have that, I, I think there's no question of, of why people will de develop depression, develop anxiety, because there's definitely a lot of environmental factors going on too. And this isn't to say that people in lower economic or GDP countries don't also face some of these same issues. I think that they do, but I think there is perhaps less of a focus. And again, I, I maybe can't speak to this so much um, just because my knowledge here is limited, but I think it's it it really is the emphasis or the focus on um, money bringing happiness and material wealth or material things bringing happiness rather than um, more uh, um, more things. I think that that many people would say are important, like spending time with family, spending time with friends, having good interpersonal communications, um, and things like that. So. Um, that's at least where I see it. I'm, I'm, I would be curious uh, about your thoughts of where, where maybe some of this is coming from. I think this is where both of us can chime in because we share one experience at least that you did quite some work in um, Austria when you're living in Graz. And I um, lived for quite some time in Sweden and I got to travel all around um, Europe. And I'm, I think when it comes to social development index, they probably rank as high as US or Canada, or probably um, even higher, um, at least in Scandinavia. Um, and if, if you were to follow the logic that a modernity um, and greed and the rat race brings people um, to the edge of um, psychological instability um, and adding that, uh, adding the, um, added weight of working long hours, which, by the way, isn't the case, actually, surprisingly, in Europe. Um, and we, we have kind of a joke there, you know, people actually work, and then after uh, a year, you know, they get vacations. Swedes, actually, they have vacations, and, you know, they go to work for fun. 
Um, so in a, in a society like this, I mean, how is that, you know, the, the indices are not any better um, when it comes to mental health, even in those societies, because I think, um, I don't have the statistics on hand, but I think in Sweden, they take more antidepressives than any place in the world. Um, so your argument, I don't know, how does it actually fit between um, working more hours um, and its correlation with mental health? And if you look at um, other places, um, let's talk about um, rural India um, or Iran um, or um, let's say Far East Asia. J Japan has one of the highest rates of suicides. India has recently showed up on that list. Um, and then you've got Iran, there are a lot of uh, issues um, when it comes to um, homicides and things like this. And I was just wondering, um, these countries, owing to their uh, economic difficulties, if we were to follow the same logic, should actually be on top of you know, mental um, disorders. And that is not the case. And so I was just wondering, how does that actually fit in with the overworked part of your argument? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. And I think um, like if, if we take Sweden or even just European countries, for an example, um, I, I think it's it's even for like the quality of work. So um, or I shouldn't say the quality of work, but the, the quality of time. Um, I can think of specifically like when I was in Austria, I was taking one to two hour lunch breaks, whereas in the US I'm eating lunch at my desk and that's that's like an everyday thing um but getting more directly to your question of you know why why the rates aren't aren't as high um again i i would maybe just point to the values of the society and although there's perhaps greater economic hardship i i really think that the the values the wants the drives um I think the problem stems from, you know, in in, in countries like India um, and Iran, like you're saying, you know, I think some of the issues really stem from, like, if we think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it comes from not having from some of those lower needs met. Where in the U.S., as an example, we we have most of those basic needs met, and it's some of these more higher, uh, more cognitive. Um, psychological needs uh, that aren't being met. And I think all through that spectrum, if you're not having some of those needs met, you're going to be having issues. And so I do think it then comes down to, are you having your needs met? And to what extent um, is, is what you're valuing meaningful? And I think uh, where that comes in is, is how you find and make meaning in life. And so I think that although there may be differences in economic status and things like that, I think there's still a lack of, of purpose or meaning in life that, that occurs. Um, and this can be forced either through economic hardship or through um, having, you know, you can have everything in the world, um, but having everything in the world doesn't make you happy if you don't have meaning or purpose. So I think that's maybe where I would draw the line of commonality. I think I would take a tangent here and you know, get more into a philosophical side of um, at least the development of Western civilization through past um, couple of centuries. I'm a big fan of um, Nietzsche's work. Um, I think in some ways um, it was very prophetic um, at the beginning of um, a cardinal shift in a collective European mentality, which Heidegger and Kant pointed in his in their works also that you know in absence um, of moral values um, and, and and the death of God which is a proverbial Nietzschean um, maxim um, there would be a realm which would make people um, empty within and this emptiness would drive them to meaninglessness that you just referred to um, and I I remember my time in um, Europe. I had wonderful conversations with very intelligent people, and I think you know they pointed out the exact same phenomenon. And it's not very uncommon to hear that people do not find meaning in life. 
uh, in the absence of that. And I think uh, a lot of um, genius in um, Dr. Jordan Peterson's work um, is also uh, pointing out the fact that um, you know when you do not have an orientation in life to where to move um, from this block, I mean, which way to go? Because in the, the end, everything falls into nihilism, and that's not a very good place to start when you're actually finding meaning in life. Um, do you believe that um, lack of religion could be a part of that, um, especially in comparison with other countries? And we do have um, absolutely reliable statistics now that, you know, having a religion in all aspects of human wellness um, actually rank higher. You know, people are generally more higher, uh, you know, higher on satisfaction with self um, if they identify with the religion. Yeah, I think this is this is a tricky question here. And, I, I, and it's tricky because if we look at, for example, the US, which we know has really high mental health issues, they also have extremely high um, religiosity. I think there there's a really good graphic um, that I can't, I, obviously I don't have right now, um, but there's a great graphic of just, I think, belief in a God or a certain religion. And it's, it's very much a downward trend as GDP increases, but then you have the U.S. like way up here kind of as an outlier um, in, in that graph. And so I, I think it, it's thorny and it's tricky, and I don't want to say um, that religion only is necessary for, for meaningfulness or purpose in life, because I do think that religion does provide a lot of meaning and does provide a lot of purpose for people. And so I think for the people that it does provide meaning and purpose, I think that's important. And it's, um, I, you know, I'm not going to take anything away from that. And I think for others who um, don't have a religious affiliation or who are atheists, I think they can still find purpose and meaning in life. It may be through some of the same avenues or it could be through different avenues of people that are uh, religious or spiritual. And so um, I think what religion does is it does help people find a way or it does give people meaning and purpose. So this is where it's tricky is I, is I can see on both sides that, you know, you can find meaning and purpose um, regardless of, of religious belief, but I do think that religious religions do help people get to finding their purpose and, and their meaning in life. So um, I think that they're a meaningful driver and force in people's lives. Um, that that that's as you were saying, like there there is evidence to support that they have a positive outcome in people's life. I think as a common denominator of both um, religious um, or non-religious um, population, um, there is something that we all aspire in life, uh, which is happiness. And uh, some of the data actually does not make sense at all. Um, and surprisingly, it comes from institutions um, that people hold in high esteem, like UN. So I've read this report in uh, the Happiness Index. Um, and it ranks Scandinavian countries quite high. And for me, as who's, who's lived in Scandinavia for quite some time, um, you know, the suicide, suicides are very common there. Um, this, um, this feeling of uh, meaningless, non-existent life um, is, is a shared one. And when it ranks, the report ranks these people highest on the list, why are these happiest people on earth committing the suicide in hordes or in numbers? I mean, something doesn't make sense. I mean, do you have any opinion on that? Or is it just like the quantitative um, GDP related happiness that you know everyone thinks that you know money makes people happy? Yeah, this is this is a good question, and and I don't want to take away from from the co complexity of the question here. Um, I think that, um, you know, I think in large part we're we're making generalizations, and I think generalizations um, are necessary. So I think 
I think it's difficult. It's difficult to say that it's the same people who are happy or have good quality of life are also the ones who are committing suicide. I, I would be surprised if that were the case. But what, you know, what might be happening, as, as you're saying, is that there is still this, um, there are still groups of people um, who, you know, may not find meaning or may not have this meaningfulness even in a society that we would maybe rank as high, having really high happiness or high GDP. Um, and I think, I think it's a, it's, it's a very difficult question that requires a lot of nuance to really speak to um, some of the reasons. And I think this is where, you know, this is where a lot of research, both in psychopathology and in personality are really coming to, um, really coming to looking at individual cases, individual people, and really trying to focus on the person as more of an individualized medicine, individualized uh, psychopathology or personality approach. And I think understanding the reasons of the per person um, is, is a good approach or a good way to try to understand what might be happening here. I think this map is very representative of um, the A standardized suicides. Um, around the world. I mean, it's a little bit older in 2016, but you know, I'm just wondering why are um, Russians quite high on the um, suicide numbers and then it's North America and then it's with Australia and then we've got India there also and I guess it's down there South Africa. So, you know, there are very few things that are common between all these things. So I guess you're your question is very valid, but it's, it's a very complex phenomenon. And I don't know if you read this book. It was already written in what was 1800s, um, uh, Le Suicide, um, which is the English, The, the Suicide, by um, Emile Durkheim, which who was a very um, influential um, um, sociologist. Um, and uh, he pinned down some of the um, common denominators that are predictors of um, suicide. For example, if you are not married and if you're single, then you're, you're you're more likely to commit suicide than someone who has a family and, and children. And if you're in an army, you're more likely. And if you are uh, more educated, you're more likely. So some of the findings are like really um, intriguing. So what could be the reason? And I'm just wondering if, if we are actually close to finding some of the common denominators? Yeah, um, this is this is where I think this this research has really become lucrative because, um, you know, I think this is one of the more difficult questions to answer and as well as one of the more impactful questions on society as a whole. Um, I and, you know, for for me, I think I bring it back to losing meaning or losing a sense of purpose, losing even just a sense of what might be a feeling of control over over life. Um, and to give an example, you, you can maybe think of a person who lost their lost their wife and maybe lost a child all in one year. Um, I think that really throws a wrench into your system of thinking of how the world works and how um, much of life is under your control and this isn't a, and this kind of gets into like locus of control as a psychology concept of just how much you feel or experience that life is is controllable and that's not to say that you know you can't feel like life is out of control or totally in control and not still have some of these things but i do think um, you know, I, I really think the common denominator does come back to this sense of meaningfulness and purpose. Like when you have a family, you know, you're living for something, even if you don't want to live yourself, you may be living for, for other people. Um, and then of course, um, your example of, of like the military, I think, um, there's a lot of external pressures and, um, a lot of stress and, um, you know, anxiety that can come along with some of those situations as well. Mm -hmm. so let's talk a little bit about um, how do these stresses and disappointments 
and traumas and pain reflects itself and manifests itself in different psychopathologies. Um, according to APA DSM uh, fifth manual, we have um, three larger uh, personality disorder clusters. And in cluster A, we, we have um, disorders um, which are odd and eccentric, um, like schizoid personality, schizotypal personality, and then we have paranoid personality, and then we have uh, externalizing uh, behavior, um, cluster B. Uh, where we have um, histrionic and narcissistic personality. Um, we have a lot of uh, papers coming on dark triad, um, which include a um, mixture of that. And then we have cluster C with anxious and fearful personality um, types with obsessive compulsive disorders. So now, now that we have a lot of um, different ways in, in which these, um, this angst within can express itself, what are some of the ways that we can actually meditate um, into the depths of what's causing that? Um, we previously talked about quantitative methods, um, about the dif differences in different cultures, how people approach um, these psychopathologies and manifestations. Um, coming from a very different culture um, where um, psychology is not a subject that you would learn at least 20 years uh, back um, as a field, but it's more of a lifestyle. Many people get to sit together and talk about things, and it's very abnormal for people to not socialize with each other. Uh, you get to live in huge collective families. They're interdependent. Um, they marry each other. Their tribes are you know, together, it's not all good and gooey, you know, there are pros and cons for every um, social system. But then I think that, you know, that's that was not something that I would understand as intuitively as you do. Um, for example, psychology itself would be a, um, it would be laughed off if we would explain it to other people because that would be a lifestyle and not something that you, know, that you can learn. Um, so I was just wondering, um, how, how do people actually approach um, these psychopathologies uh, and does it actually have a cultural component of that? So I think this, this, this is something I, that has really been on my mind a lot. And I'll start with first of um, just even going back to the DSM, as, as you had kind of talked about some of the criticisms. And the example that I like to bring up is that, um, you know, I think it's improved beyond the example that I'm going to provide. And it's a very simplified example. So I don't mean to piss off any clinical psychologists here. But, um, you know, in the DSM, there, let's say, are nine uh, symptoms of depression. And so to have depression, you need to have at least five of those symptoms. So what that can mean is that uh, you could have five symptoms of depression. I could have five symptoms of depression, but it's totally possible for us to only have one overlapping symptom. And yet we're both still being classified as having depression. And I think that runs into a very big problem. Um, and I think this is where many psychologists are critical, critical of the DSM, as well as moving into more of a dimensional spectrum, as well as moving into more of a kinds perspective where, you know, you may have a depression that is more kind of more on the angry externalizing side where people are actually um, putting their um, depression symptoms that are kind of more put out into the world versus internalizing where people are um, really, um, their symptoms are kind of more focused inward or, or their depression is more of an inward focus. And I think that this really starts to connect with a, a person's disposition, a person's personality. And I think this is where personality can um, vary in which people express certain disorders. Um, we can even just think about uh, introversion, extroversion, as I was just saying, an extroverted person might be more likely to, to externalize and push out their um, symptoms or their depression versus a person who's more introverted might 
bring everything into them. And then to bring this then fully to your question um, with with cultures and how this might affect things, I think that this is is one of the most widely um, cited criticisms of psychology is that we tend to s study what are called weird uh, samples. So this is um, white, educated, industrialized, um, rich, and democratic societies, which really is a very small portion of the world and the people that live in it. And so I think this is where culture really can have a role in even just um, how we think about psychology and think about psychopathology. There's a very interesting example um, that I had gotten from, from a professor of biological uh, psychology, where he, he explained that in uh, Japan, I think this was, and I could be quoting this wrong, but I want to make the information is correct, is in Japan there, um, in, in the seventies, or maybe it was earlier or later, there, there really wasn't a word for stress. So it's not that people weren't experiencing what we would maybe call stress, but it wasn't named or put in a way. And so in that, it, because of that, people weren't necessarily seen as stressed, you know, they might just make claims like, well, I just have a lot of work on my plate, or, you know, there's a lot of family things, etc. Um, but in, in about the 70s, I believe it was this stress was introduced into the vernacular. And that language has such a powerful role in the way in which we perceive and understand the world. So I think even just in that regard, um, this is, I think, where culture really plays a really strong role in this is, as you're saying, if, if you think psychology is just kind of a joke or if it's just kind of something that you talk about, but it's not really something, you know, worth studying or has any meaningful impact, then I think it, it has a role in the way in which you maybe explain or talk about things. And this, I think, people will will be critical of this position because what it what it starts to say is well is there really a biological basis for these things is there really something that's underlying or is this just culture specific is this are psychological disorders a figment of society um and i think these are where some of the strongest debates and conversations are are continued to being had now talking about biologically verifiable claims um let's move on to something else which has been repeatedly shown as a uh, very potent and promising um therapy um around the word um in non-western cultures like israeli and kabbalah or um indian ashrams and um, throughout the islamic word with the name of sufism that that had been a established practice for a, a long time and it has recently seeped into um, psychological literature um, and um, Western debate uh, with the name of mindfulness and meditation. What's your take on that? Yeah, so I, I have very, uh, very strong opinions here. I I really appreciate mindfulness and I think it does a lot. And I think used appropriately, it, it does a lot of good. Um, I think particularly for Western societies and societies that are more focused on things and um, like things by meaning material things, as well as like focused on the go, go, go and stuff like that. I think there is where this has become really beneficial is it, it helps people stop and reflect. And I think that stopping and reflecting and being in the moment and um, just settling the mind is, I think, something that's that's just necessary for psychological, I'm going to use a term that I don't think is an official term, um, but I think it's necessary for like psychological cleansing of really refreshing and um, clearing out your head. And so I think this is where it's become really popular because we've seen that it can be um, used as an intervention for a lot of things. 
Now, one thing that I do wonder about is for people that are already mindful um, more generally in their life, whether they're doing it through meditation practices or if in general they tend to reflect and really look inward a lot in their life out of just perhaps their personality or their disposition, I wonder if that could sometimes go too far where people start ruminating on certain ideas and things and they get stuck kind of on this inward focus um, rather than letting some of that stuff go. Um, I, I have no research or evidence to to support that. That I think is just a, a question that I have in my mind of, of whether that, that can be the case. Um, but I think in general, overall, it's been a very positive thing. I, I would be curious your thoughts about it um, as well as it's it's kind of rise and emergence. I tend to, uh, I will just say, I tend to view the um, like westernized versions of it as maybe a superficial practice relative to um, Eastern practices where I know there it's a bit more part of the lifestyle. It's a bit more part of the routine. It's There's spiritual um, involvement in, in the practice. So I think the westernized version is a bit more superficial than than the the eastern or the original version of mindfulness um well i would have to concur with you that you know um the eastern version is probably not as fashionable um yoga loving um pot smoking um free lifestyle uh, depiction of uh, what mindfulness is. But then um, I can only speak for myself and I have uh, meditated for as long as I remember. Um, but that comes not only with uh, the exercise of mindfulness and focusing on one thing with breathing in and breathing out practice, but also with a lot of philosophical um, bedrock for that that means that you know um a lot of our problems and struggles and pain comes from our expectations and um the perceived um uh, injustices um that we think um have been dealt to us and um once you you forget the fact that um that word is fair to no one and attachment is actually the source of suffering and which i don't think is it, it's it's exclusive to sufism and i think that's the buddhist um, philosophy also itself that you know the source of um pain and misery comes from undue attachment with things um and the deep satisfaction and happiness only stems um from um extreme and utter um, content and satisfaction with oneself, only then can you um, forgive not only yourself and others, which is a prerequisite of you know, moving forward and become a happy person. And unhappy people do not make other people happy. So that's where actually I come from um, in this tradition. And I believe it has served me quite well um, in 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 such that I've been able to um, able to forgive um, and understand other people uh, at least as much as I do myself, uh, which would be the right thing to do. Um, which brings me to a very um, good segue into your own work um, about the gifts that we have and how to use them for the benefit of not only make your side a, um, life um, better, but also around uh, people around you. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, your paper on uh, humor. Can you tell us what do we know about humor in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a personality? What are the predictors of that? And what are the manifestations of that in social expressions? Yeah, this is... Um... I think one of the, the one of the most fun topics of research that that one can really study. I mean, who doesn't like to laugh? Who doesn't like to joke around? I feel like that's um, it's just such fun work, and I think that there's still so much work to be done. 
Um, I really have to give a lot of credit to my PhD supervisor, Paul Silvia, who has really, um, he has a huge investment in this work um, and is a, a hilarious person himself. Um, so I think humor can be broken down into, it, into different uh, aspects or facets uh, that we might talk about. So we can think about humor as, appreci as appreciation um, so this can just be, you know, hearing a joke and laughing at it. One might think of a sense of humor or having a good sense of humor. Um, and then we can also think of humor as humor production. And so this is coming up with jokes on the spot, um, coming up with really witty remarks in daily conversations and things like that. Um, so one thing that we, we see with humor appreciation is that this really varies. And this is, I think, more strongly connected to different pieces of personality. Um, I, I, to, to give an example, um, disagreeable people might find jokes about race and sex funny versus um, more agreeable people would not probably not find those things funny. Um, it's totally possible that you could be agreeable and find those things funny and see no harm in them. Um, and this is just to give an example of, of some of the flavors that um, personality can then associate with uh, appreciation. Now, when it comes to actual production, we see um, we see something that maybe people wouldn't expect. So extroversion is kind of known as like the social traits or like the trait of people who love people or all about people. And so one would expect that extroversion would really be the strong trait coming out for who's who's really funny. And I think this is actually true when it comes to social contexts and everyday interactions and things like that. Um, but I, when it comes to actual writing down humor and coming up with ideas on the spot, what we actually find is that it's openness to experience. Um, and openness to experience is a very broad trait. Um, it's very broad, complex. I think it's still one, it's one of the more misunderstood traits or still needs more research. This is uh, where my expertise comes in. I really love this trait because of that. And people who are open tend to be more creative. They tend to be more open-minded more generally to things. Um, and they tend to, it tends to correlate with intelligence. So open um, people tend to be higher in, in intelligence. And so we really start to see that humor when people are coming up with witty things to say is associated with intelligence and it's associated with with open to an experience and, and creativity and so we've done a, a number of different studies now replicating this finding over and over um, and uh, reviewers always give us the question they always say well what about extroversion where is extroversion and i think where this piece really comes in is in in social cues and social aspects so i think extroverts one study that we've thought of is having people tell the same joke to a camera or to an audience. And so where I think extroversion plays a role is a person's ability to deliver a joke. So you might think of, um, you know, extroverted people tend to have a lot of stories and these stories tend to be funny. And so it's really kind of the whole delivery and kind of the cadence that they have of delivering the joke, perhaps more so than the joke itself. A person could tell perhaps the same joke but because they're flat and they're monotone and they just don't get into the joke, it's just, it's like, okay, uh, there's no like sort of reaction to it. Um, so this is where I think uh, there's, again, still a lot of research to be done. Like why is an extroversion, at least in the, the studies we've done related to, to humor. And I think it's really this, this social, this social piece. I think it's very interesting. And the fact that now that I've, think about is that um, I, I didn't know that that was a scientific fact that, you know, if you're more disagreeable, you would find the racist jokes uh, funny. Um, and th th that has been my experience, at least. Um, I mean, even though I can enjoy that at times, but I think German humor can be very racist. And I don't know if you can relate that in Austria, but, you know, they don't mean it like um, as an insult, but that's kind of a normal um, conversation there, and I think um, a lot of people would be booed off of the stage um, on op open mics, um, like Joe Rogan and um, Trevor Noah. I mean, that's not an acceptable form of comedy here. 
you know people generally think that you know no, 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 there's no way you know this guy is saying things like that and they'll get to talk to us that's a very interesting um point that uh, you brought up i was just wondering that um if you look at the domain level openness to experience that is a cumulative score of all six facets below that and then there's one aspect of that which is normally um, deemed to be in causing um, the um, both the um, academic um, thinking and as well as humor uh, to some part also which is intellect and I just wondering if that intellect um, people who are generally good at humor are they also good at um, academics or is it just like a different kind of humor uh, oh sorry a different kind of intellect mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is where there's more research. This, these are these are great questions. Um, you know, we we did do a study of of um, or we I should say we as a part of a study we did look at the facets. Now this is unpublished. We haven't gone anywhere with this um, in part because I think we want to collect more data. But it is as you're saying. It is this intellectual side. Um, but it def it's it's not necessarily the academic side. I think I think it is kind of a different sort of style or piece of intellect or or maybe type of intellect as as you as we're talking about here. Um, but one thing that I think really came through was um, like this open mindedness side of openness to experience. So a key part of humor is being able to entertain um, ideas that maybe um, go against world views or norms of the world, but somehow being able to bring them back together um, or being able to associate things that are pretty disparate and seemingly unrelated um, and then kind of bring them together into a conclusion or to a whole. So I think a key attribute as a part of openness to experience. I think, I think let me phrase it a little different. Do you think that people who are academically gifted are are good at humor also? Would you call yourself someone who can, you know, break a room to laughter? I would me personally I would say probably not. I think I think my humor style is a bit more like witty side remarks here and there. Sarcastic. Definitely I'm not going to be the one to uh, be in front of the room and tell a joke. Uh, that's definitely, I, not my style. So I, th I, I think that's where I would say it's, it's different. Yeah, I, I would not. Wait, wait, can, we, can we generalize that? I mean, because professors, um, and I guess that applies to um, a lot of junior positions at university. Also, they, they generally deem this um, very to the point. Um, offhand, um, straightforward, and they enjoy a more intellectual, verbal bickering instead of you know the humor one. Uh, do you do you think that it's a fair statement that um, academics do not rank very high um, on humor, um, at least how it's understood um, among the masses? Yeah, no, I, I I would definitely agree with that statement. And I think, you know, I think to bring some perspective on kind of how we do these humor studies, um, what we will do is we'll have like a New Yorker cartoon, which is like a funny image that then people have to caption, or we'll have like a funny, uh, like noun noun combination, like cereal bus, and people come up with a definition for that, or um, like yoga bank is another one that we use, and people have to come up with humorous definitions. Um, or, you know, we'll give people a joke stem like, oh, that that class was so boring. It was like um, and then people will complete that joke. And so people do this. They, they type out their responses. And then it's actually us academics who are then rating these responses. So I think this is where some of the uh, and this criticism is well due of it all depends on who's rating it. So I think if you have academics writing academics, yeah, they're probably going to find academics funny because you know that's the the crowd they're a part of. But uh, for a more general audience, is that necessarily true? Are all people going to agree on something that's funny? And I think we can definitively say that that's not the case. So I think this is where some of the research really needs to go. Is is as much as we're looking at who's coming up with the jokes. We also need to look at who's even subjectively rating like what's funny and what's not. And I think that's where. Oh, why don't you 
why did you bring in uh, people from the open mic and people like Joe Rogan and um, Trevor Noah and other people who, who are generally very good at you know feeling the pulse of um, how the crowd is actually feeling so then you can make them laugh and then they can make them cry. I think that rhetoric itself it, it, it's indicative of some kind of trait that I don't know which trait out of all those 30 facets in big five would correlate to that. What do you think? Yeah. I, you know, I want to say that that is, is kind of a form of, uh, of intelligence. I think that that is part of intelligence. Wait, I have another guest. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's also an extra version. There's thing called gregariousness. And I was just wondering if, I, mean, I would be very interested to see um, the factor loadings um, of gregarious or at least some kind of correlation between. Um, so let's put it in a um, research question uh, manner in which you take um, personality scores from um, stand up comedians and then the normal people. Or let's say the academics, you know. The difference is huge, um, and then uh, then we could just see their scores and gregarious, and and then we can probably see that you know if they are largely differing in that um, dimension, um, sorry, the facet, then then that would be you know indicative of the fact, and that could probably be actually used to filter out um, talent in at school level or something. No, this you you're reminding me actually that there is there is a paper um, that looks at intelligence, uh, personality traits, and humor styles in um, professional stand-up comedians compared to to college students, and they did use the neo. Let's see, I'm looking at the paper right now here. They they only use the I think twelve or sorry, the 60 item Neo. So I don't think they were able to look at facets. Um, okay. But what they But don't you think that 60 unquestioned item uh, um, score test also has all the 30 facets in it? It's a shorter version, but then still it should have that. It'll, yeah, it'll have like one or two items per. So it's hard to get, oh. it's hard to say that they got a good measure of it. Um, they would have to probably break it down pretty, pretty well here. Um, but one thing that they do see actually, and this is kind of strange, is that uh, openness was negatively related to humor production and extroversion was negatively related to how funny people were. But I think this is an issue, one, of small sample size, and two... So what, what um, does it mean? Does it mean that if you are more conservative and traditional and more introvert, then you'd be good at humor? I mean, are the professors actually judging that? Because that's the only way that makes sense. <laughs> I think this is, this is, only, this is only among stand-up comedians. So I think the, the okay. problem is... is you have a group of comedians who are already higher than average on openness to experience. And so when you get into this higher than average group, it's then saying, well, you know, the people in this higher than average group, the ones lower on it are kind of funnier, but they're still higher than the average college student or the, the average person. So I think it's hard to say because I think it's an effect of the group of being in a professional stand-up comedians when everyone is open to experience then it doesn't seem to matter or it matters the inverse um, of what we typically find but shouldn't they have done um, a multi-study um, paper in which they subsequently should have compared the means of openness experience uh, with normal people mm -hmm. yes and they they did look at that and they did find that stand-up comedians were higher on openness than than regular people or even the ones who are lower on openness um yeah openness was negatively correlated with how how funny they were or how funny they were rated to be but they were again they were rated still more funny than college students more funny than the average person um and they were also again higher on openness um, so I think it's just an effect of, of the group rather than it actually being um, like le more conservative, 
um, comedians are funnier. Um, I was also wondering, you know, it brings me to the another aspect of and the kind of research that you do, um, and I think that's more of your core area, which is um, the creative aspect of being um, original. And um, one of the books that is absolutely a uh, classical um, text, um, I recommend everyone to read. Um, it's a canonical book on the topic. Um, I have one of my favorite professors, uh, Adam Grant, about uh, originals. And he also did absolutely uh, phenomenal way of delivering um, his research. Um, his TED talk on that um, has millions of views, um, and in which he talks about um, not only the gifts uh, and the prerequisites of being original, but he also says that there's absolutely no way to find that the creative process. And you talked ab about that uh, in many of your papers, one with, uh, with your supervisor, is it BT Roberts? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very bad with names. Um, yeah, Roger, and then good friend, yep. Okay, um, I, was, I was looking at uh, this paper of yours, Keeping Creativity Under Control, Contributions of Attention and Control and Fluid Intelligence to Divergent Thinking. Um, and I'm just wondering, can we ever actually make sense of uh, or even predict people who are genuinely original and creative? Because you know there are a lot of things uh, that seem to be very contradictory when it comes to creative people. And as someone who takes a lot of interviews, you know, help people um, hire gifted students, especially in data science with students with high IQ level. There's always like, they would be late, you know, they would be all chaotic. And I think I, we work together and I, at some point, you know, um, I've also figured out that you, know, you are all over the place also before you actually get something done. And, you know, I can see inklings of that in my own work. and. Um, structure also. And I'm just wondering, do we actually have any um, any literature on that that would give us some insight into what's going on um, in in that prefrontal cortex? Yeah. So, no. Uh, let me first just second the recommendation for Adam Grant's Originals. That is a great book, as well as. Um, Scott Barry Kaufman's Wired to Create, which he goes into, I think, a little bit more of the neuroscience side of things, but he does, he, he and Adam both do a great job of really condensing the science into a digestible, digestible format that doesn't lose any of the quality of the science. So really recommend those. Um, but as far as, you know, I think the creative process is what you're saying. It's so hard to define. And so I think even just how we even measure what creativity is, um, there are many complaints about how that's being done. And I won't get into that measurement side of things um, uh, at, right now, but I think there is, there is evidence kind of for this, this messiness and where this messiness kind of comes from is, um, or, or how this kind of helps creative or original ideas is that there's, there's this messiness that enables cross domain or cross um, concept connections. And it's kind of through this messiness that an idea might pop into your head that's a seemingly unassociated with another idea, but you somehow make a connection. And it's kind of through this messiness that we, that we can kind of see um, where this creativity or this originalness comes from. But there's, there's a certain extent to that too, right? Like, you could have two concepts or ideas that are just totally random and putting them together will maybe be original, but is it creative? Is it useful in any way, shape or form? And, and you know, random ideas are unlikely to do that. So there's a certain level of structure that you need to be able to bring things together that, that are actually related, but there's also this inherent messiness of the process. And I think untangling that is gonna be a really difficult really difficult problem. Um, so when we think of that in the brain, um, what that means in the brain is we actually kind of do see this more diffuse spread activation and connectivity. So you're talking about one of the key regions of the brain, which is the medial prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, which is kind of sits 
at the front, but kind of in the middle of your frontal lobe there. And that is like coordinating all sorts of different activity all over the brain, um, particularly in highly creative people and uh, a little bit less so um, in less creative people. Now, what makes it more fascinating is that just um, on um, on the edge of where we think that we're we hold on to something, um, some corner um, of this uh, knitting ball, which would give us some insight into how this works, and then we can actually nurture the creative people and find that there is an additional uh, piece of information that I find it unbelievably complex and I have not been able to um, untangle that um, riddle in a way that um, and, and that topic is very close to my heart also because um, I work with a lot of people um, who come from disadvantaged um, background and you know have um, have not received support that they should have um, and had they received that you know they would have um, come up with great um, works um, of art, music, and other things. Um, it's neurodiversity. Um, and if you look at the movie like Rain Man, um, and unbelievably um, creative, creative Aspies uh, and people with Asperger's. Um, again, I'm terrible with names, but there's a full documentary with that. There's this whole phenomenon called uh, Savant Syndrome was that there's one guy um, and he's disabled, um, but his gift is that if, if you um, put him in a chopper and you, you uh, fly him over um, landscape of any city, so he would just have a look, um, a, an aerial view of the city, and he would just come down and would just paint the whole panorama. And it would be unbelievable the amount of granular detail that he goes into and reproduces everything that he's seen only once. And then there's just another guy um, who only listens to tune once, and then he just simply plays it on the piano, and he claims to have remembered 30,000 tunes in memory, which is, I mean, there's no equivalent of that in conscious memory. If you're a memory researcher or any literature that I have gone to, there's, there's no possible way that you could remember so much. And then when we talk about, I don't know if it was Bach or Mozart, you know, he was blind and, you know, he could just compose music. Uh, sometimes I just try to wonder, I mean, if you're blind and you're you're composing music, how do you visualize the notes and, you know, the sounds? There must be some kind of depiction in their brain and you know, what note comes after which one. And this vicarious feeling of imagination of this creative process actually goes into the brain that, that leaves me really um, nonplus. How do you see this? I mean, I think I think this is uh, baffling for you and I both. I I'm not sure how this this works either. Um, it, it's yeah, I think it's remarkable. I, I think it's still m mysterious just how um, savants and and alike uh, how people really really do this. Um, I think it's just just baffling, and there's there's some good work. Um, I believe this is Jennifer Drake who has done research on gifted kids, um, uh, like savant like abilities with with artworks and drawing. Um, like there, she showed some examples of these kids drawing hyper realistic like dinosaurs and sea creatures and stuff like that at the age of like four or five. Uh, years old. And, you know, I think one thing that I think fails to get emphasized is I think we see these as gifts and we think that these these people were just born with it. And that's not to say that they weren't born with some uh, high level of predisposition towards these things. But one thing that all of these people do is that they they do practice their gift. They do actually they have this talent and they have this spectacular um, uh, intelligence that we can call it. And one thing that they do do is that they do practice it and they do use it. And I think that, I think for us who are not savants or, or, or these spectacularly gifted people is, is if anything, encouraging. 
what it suggests is if we practice and we spend time on things, we can get better and we can uh, turn into experts and things like that. There's the old 10,000 hours adage. Um, but when it comes to, you know, being a savant like that, I think, I think, you know, that that's a very special thing. We don't really understand too much. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we shouldn't hope to be like that, but I think at the very least, the encouraging part is that with practice, we can get to very high levels of, of ability and technique. Um, one of the favorite lines um, on this topic that I actually have gotten surprisingly from, um, and I love cartoon movies for some reason, uh, that comes from uh, um, this movie called uh, Let Tui. Um, it's a rat who learns to cook. And then um, there's a very um, inspiring line in that, that you know, um, not everyone can be a great cook, but a great cook can come from every anywhere. And I was just wondering if you, if you put um, you know, this adage into societies, the basic goal of any reasonable human society is to maximize the um, development and prosperity through utilizing the gifts of people as much as it can be. And neurodiversity is one part of that. And I was just wondering um, the methods that we today have to identify these people and put them to good use and give them an environment that is nurturing and encouraging um, and supportive. Um, that hasn't been, um, to say the least, um, as developed as I would like it to be. Now, for example, um, let's talk to uh, about the other aspect of um, human personality and life. Um, there are only two things that if you know those things uh, that would help you immensely, um, not only in your life, finding purpose, but also um, in deeper satisfaction. One is your personality type, another is the IQ. So, Let's talk about IQ now. The current measures of IQ, these would not apply to people um, who fall in this um, category of savants. But what can we do um, to make them fit into mainstream smooth, smoothly without any problems? And then second, um, what are your views on IQ? So this is always a hotly debated topic, right? Um, so for your for the first question, and this is moving um, like more savant-like abilities into more mainstream societies. That that way, that way you were saying, yeah. Um, I think it's a tough one because I think just as you were saying, I think we should support their gifts and their abilities. And I think part of me, part of me just says we should be just respecting people as, as they are for the most part. I mean, there's obvious things like harming other people is, is something we should intervene on. Um, mental health, if people are having really difficult time, et cetera, there's obvious things there. But I think as far as we should work on ways of incorporating their skills into things that we're either already doing or for example like creating a position that utilizes their gifts into something where they fit in and there i think there's a good example of this this woman um who has who has these abilities where she was integrated into it was either some industry or business and they were able to use her her gifts in a in a meaningful and productive way and I think one that gave her meaning and purpose to her gift and what she was doing, it wasn't just like, oh, look, I can do this. She was able to do it in an implied way. So that was positive for her. And then on the other side, it's also having a very positive influence on society. So I think just being able to find ways to integrate their skills and gifts, like I don't think we need to change them. I think we should change for them to help them integrate into integrate their gifts into society because we would all be better for it. And then when it comes to IQ, because right, as you were saying, these gifts would probably not be picked up 
on the standard IQ tests, as well as many other uh, people, just in general, the their abilities do not get picked up on IQ. So I think one thing, my opinion on IQ is that it's just a number and that we should be a little dismissive of it. That's not to say it's not meaningful. I think IQ is meaningful for certain types of things. So I think IQ is meaningful for academic-like positions. Um, and I think it's meaningful for general strategy use and taking and, and certain positions in the world. But um, I think for me, IQ is, is just one piece of the picture and just like personality is one piece of the picture. And I think taking into account the whole person and their experiences really matters, um, really matters so much. And I, I personally, I think I value experience more than I do intelligence because I think you can have the raw goods, but the experience um, that you have that you've built up over time um, is often more defined to specific roles where I like we can kind of think of it as hardware or software like hardware might be IQ and that's giving it a little bit too much credit it's a little bit more plastic than or flexible than than hardware is but IQ we can think of as hard, hardware where software we can constantly update and learn and change and I think most skills that we have or do like crafts um, that that we do is software and it's malleable and it goes back to that ratatouille a uh, quote that you just had that um, it, not everyone can be a great cook, but great cooks can come from anyone or can come from anywhere. And I think that I think should be the focus is how do we recruit and find and cultivate um, these gifts that people have? I think especially in underdeveloped countries or countries with less resources or are disadvantaged. I, I think there are so many people that are overlooked because they don't have certain IQ, which is largely scholastically related rather than what their skills might be. Um, so th that's the long and short of it. For me, IQ is, is a number. It's a part of the picture, but it's, it's to me, there, there are other aspects of people that, that I think matter more. Yeah, I totally agree that, you know, IQ or a personality test in isolation should never be used uh, for any position and that is um, that requires um, a certain level of experience and um, fairness, of course. Uh, but I was also wondering that, you know, societies that have developed throughout um, the human history, and I've read all 23 of them, um, um, at one point or another. And from what I have been able to understand as a pattern is that all societies um, that have excelled have nurtured and identified and garnered people who were best at the jobs um, that they were recruited for. Um, I think one of the examples that you can relate to um, being from the US is that, you know, a lot of, um, the genius um, in, in terms of ideas in US comes from the fact that they were able to bring all these Soviet um, scientists after the disintegrated, disintegrated integration of USSR. It could be Chomsky's and Pavlov's um, and uh, Kasparov and people like this. And it was, it was a place where people could freely work on their talents without being discriminated or until recently, that was the case. Um, and then, now I was just wondering, especially in context of underdeveloped countries, I mean, we've, we've recently had a Nobel Prize uh, to achieve a banner in economics on his work on microfinance. Um, and if, if that were a society that would not value the uniqueness or differentness, if that's the word, uh, or let's say, um, their the creative genius then it wouldn't have been possible for someone like him or anywhere anyone else for that matter to learn from other people um, who are like-minded and i was just wondering um are, are there any uh because you come from a personality psychology uh, background with experience in grounding both in social psychology and iq and 
um, you have taught courses in social psychology and um, introduction, um, introduction courses in abnormal psychology. Are there any differences when it comes to creativity and openness and humor and personality in general um, in terms of gender, age, um, socioeconomic uh, background? Um, what are some of the um, larger differences that we know of? Yeah, this is a this is a very interesting question because uh, there are so many different avenues that I could take this. Um, I'll start first with with gender differences. Now, these really tend to be actually really minimal. Um, I think typically the gender differences that are found in research are usually very small effects. Um, sure, there there are differences. For example. Uh, women tend to be a bit more extroverted than men um, and perhaps more agreeable. Um, and there, there are small differences, but I, you know, these have yet to be also classified within cultural expectations, which we know has huge influence on the development of people's, people's lives and their trajectories. Um, and as far as IQ, um, I, again, I think there is not large differences. I Again, this is something I don't have evidence and I can't remember the source of this, but I've heard that women tend to have a, a, a more stable range of IQ, whereas men could either like be very stupid or very smart and they're a little bit more like random along the continuum. Um, which in some sense makes sense biologically. I, I'm not much for evolutionary perspectives, but we could take an evolutionary perspective where uh, if a mother is the caregiver, it would help that she isn't like really stupid um, for taking care of, of children. Um, but I don't think, you know, I don't think gender differences, there's, there's very much. Now, I think age differences, this is one of the, I think, more fascinating things in personality psychology. Actually, let me take one step back to, to gender differences and humor. Um, now, this is controversial, um, but there was a meta-analysis that uh, came uh, as a part of my lab that showed that he, uh, women tend to be better humor appreciators, um, but men tend to be funnier. And this was, again, a very small effect. There are possible evolutionary reasons for this. Um, but again, like it's a small effect and I wouldn't make too much of a big deal of that. There are many hilarious women, there are many hilarious men. Um, so going forward then to, to age, this is, this is kind of a very interesting place for personality because what we see with age is that for example, openness to experience tends to go down over time. Um, sensation seeking, so like extroversion, um, like a facet of extroversion tends to also go down over time, which, which makes sense. Um, but one of the key things of aging and personality is the type of questions we ask. So this is one of my, I think, main criticisms of personality research right now is we've designed uh, all of our questions that we ask towards kind of the college student age range. And, you know, does it make sense to ask an older adult if like they like to go on roller coasters? There's a great example of, um, uh, of this in a uh, special issue of European Journal of Personality. I'm sorry for the authors, I don't remember who they are, but it, there's a cool article just looking at like, the effects of, of age and the questions that we ask. And um, a, a key piece, a key part of that is what is also culturally acceptable. And one of my favorite examples comes from openness. So we can look at maybe 20 and maybe let's take it back further, even 30 or 40 years ago when the LGBTQ plus crowd um, values and beliefs about that, that, that group were you would be open-minded if you were accepting of those people. Whereas today the standards have moved where LGBTQ plus is an accepted group. And although there are some people that still marginalize them, they're now, um, it's now no longer considered open-mindedness to be accepting of them. That's kind of now the cultural standard, at least in the US. 
it's a cultural standard to accept um, to to accept people of of different sexual orientation. And so I think this is one of the more difficult things is it's hard to say as people age with regards to personality, the the culture also kind of shifts into what who and what and how people are, for example, more agreeable. I think openness is the easy one to draw examples from. But this one, I think, is is a, just a very interesting example that we don't really have or know or, or have an answer for, um, because the goal sticks, they, they kind of move. And so that that's, I think, a challenge for personality going forward, especially if we're going to be looking at longitudinally how people change and develop personality over time. Um, as far as humor, again, I think most research is conducted on college students, as as so much of psychology research is. So I think these this is why funding for uh, aging research has really increased, is because we know we know less about these populations and samples. Um, let's talk about the um, hereditary influences um, over personality. Um, we have a very um, huge database of genome-wide association studies now. Um, are genes responsible for some expressed uh, personality behaviors? Yeah, I got some strong opinions on, on this question. Um, <laughs> and part of it, I think, just stems from um, with these gene-wide associations, we're typically looking at one SNP, which is just a pairing of single nucleotides or um, single parts of the string of DNA that for any given gene, we maybe have two, 300 of these. And so we're often looking at a very small fraction of what a gene even is. Um, so what we tend to find is, is that there's like very small meaningful differences to the point of like, 0.1% uh, of the variance or 0.1% prediction. Um, for some of the larger ones, it gets up to maybe 1%. Um, and so when we add these together, we can build sort of a picture of what might be happening. And we might get up to like, I think 20% is kind of the usual when we add up all the effects that 20% we can say is specifically to, to genes. Um, but there's a very specific, there's a there's actually a problem for this because when we see heritability, we see that there's, uh, most things are about 50% heritable, if not higher. So this is actually known as the missing heritability problem where we count up all these genes and we're only at 20%, but in our like twin study research where we can look at where people have the same genes, there's this huge gap of difference of 30% of our prediction that's missing. And so where is that? What, what does that mean? And I think part of this is just due to um, quite literally our, our, our genes in some sense change over time. Um, not necessarily like mutation change, but there's, there's um, a biological function called methylation that will um, turn off and on certain sets of genes and proteins uh, based on different environments that we're, um, that we're uh, exposed to. And so it, through our environments, th these effects are called epigenetic uh, effects. Through our environments and through our exposure can then affect what genes are expressed and, effective, and, and to this extent, how we, we develop. And so... Um, I think we'll always find that personality is heritable. I think the question is the extent to which this is due to having specific genes. And this is a much more difficult problem and question to, to answer. Um, I think it's easy to look within our families and say, well, you know, we share a lot of similar characteristics. Uh, there, there are things there. Um, some of that's due to shared environments, some of it's due to genes. Um, but I think, I think there's a, there's a difficult piece of we're missing some prediction and we're not sure where, where this her heritability is, is really coming from. I'd be curious of, of your thoughts on, on 
Yes, I, I think I, I taught a lecture on that in my Into the Site class where uh, we talked about flamingos um, and how phenotypes and genotypes actually affect their skin color. Um, so if you took two newborn uh, flamingos in a different part of the world, one would remain white, another would turn into pink. And that has to do something with kind of the food that's available and the amount of the food and the environment itself. So that is the given that you know, phenotypes do affect um, how genes are expressed or not. But on, um, on an opposing side, um, just like medical diseases transfer like diabetes or heart diseases or, um, uh, well, other diseases that are easily quantifiable, that is also the case, at least from the sparse evidence that we have, um, that mental disorders do also um, kind of run in the families. So I know a lot of cases where bipolar runs in the family, and you know it continues uh, in the new generation. Um, and so that makes me believe that there is a strong case to be made um, to at least study genome-wide association studies, but then um, psychology has a very dark past, as you know yourself, that we have been doing um, some very unethical human experiences. And when it comes to genome-wide studies, um, we have this euthanasia um, and um, other marginalizing practices. Um, also in terms of IQ, there was a very con controversial book uh, by Charles Murray about bell curve. Um, so we need to be very sure that we isolate the phenomena being studied um, and quantitatively establish that while remaining in the ethical boundaries of that. Um, which brings me um, to another interesting topic, and that has been debated throughout um, the history of um, human behavior modification. Um, behavioralists um, believe in that um, uh, maxim as it, as it's out of Bible, which is that you know economic behavior actually can be modified and observable, and everything is, in essence, your physical word. And so you, the 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 nurture aspect um, dominates the higher order needs um, of human beings. So one of the seminal books um, written by um, John von Neumann in 1944 uh, what about, was about zero-sum game in, uh, and the name of the book was Theory of Game and uh, Economic Behavior. And since then it has been studied along and then we have John Nash about um, writing about the equilibrium states and um, a lot of work has been done. Um, but what I want to understand is that how could a fair study of a human social system be designed in which and I shared one of the papers yesterday um, on my LinkedIn as well as with you also, which I find really interesting about the reinforcement um, learning from the computer science domain and how that's applied in um, human decision making um, in social systems um, to somehow make the process more understandable and quantifiable through some use of some function um, be it neural networks, machine learning algorithm, so that we can understand the interactions of human beings with its environment in a meaningful way. Do you think that it's a line of study that 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 should be taken seriously, or at least you know has some promise to it? Yeah, I think I think this is inevitably where we need to go. I think even if only to try to discover some of the underlying mechanisms of human behavior here. Um, and I think a quantum mechanics approach and generally these physics approaches are honestly the way to go. Because if we think of physics as kind of the basis for mm -hmm. reality, then, you know, physics is ultimately going to be a part of everything that we do. And so when we get to then controlling or modifying behavior, um, I think it's important to understand that controlling or modifying behavior can change other aspects of our life. And I think 
this is where we, we run into ethical issues. This is where we need to be very careful in how we change uh, people's lives. Um, and looking at, yeah, go ahead. I was just asking, you know, we have a question here also. Um, the, the, in that context, maybe you can relate it to uh, the topic being discussed. Is how can reinforcement learning and experimenting um, with the social system um, be beneficial um, in in curing or curbing at least um, depression, um, which seems to be one of the, or at least I think uh, according to new statistics, the highest cause of disability, at least in the Western world. Yeah, this is where, you know, I think, I think cognitive behavioral therapy is proving to be a very strong and effective behavioral modification tool. Um, I know it's even gone as far as I believe Noom, the weight uh, control and weight loss application uses cognitive behavioral therapy, some of its tools to help people reach their goals of weight loss. And so in, in terms of depression here, like the underlying foundations, I think, of cognitive behavioral therapy is first changing the way that you think and perceive and by changing your thoughts, you change your behaviors. And I think it, it, if you don't change thoughts and you just change behaviors, then you're gonna go right back to getting stuck in the loop that you were in. So I think it really starts with changing thought patterns, changing how we think, which then changes how we can perceive the world as, as you very well stated, um, you, you, you know, how we see the world has a role in the way in which, you know, how we might perceive psychology even, or like depression. Um, and so I think it's through this, this point of we have some tools to be able to do this. And I think we should, should be careful to what we change and don't change. Um, and I'll quickly go through, through a very cool example of there was a, there was this Russian scientist who uh, was specifically selecting for a trait in foxes. He wanted to breed pet foxes. And so this uh, work, I think, is now almost 100 years old now. But he started with finding in a group of foxes the most uh, domesticated or the most gentle, nice foxes. And he breeded these foxes together. And he actually ended up dying before this work was completed. But... It took about three generations of breeding the most kind foxes to get to a domesticated fox. This is all really cool, but what ended up happening is that these foxes actually ended up looking more kind of like our pets. They had softer ears, more floppy ears. They were generally smaller than the other foxes. And, and so what happened was selecting for this very specific trait of being friendly or being kind as a fox also changed a number of other aspects. And so this is where um, I think obviously with depression, we would argue that getting a person out of depression is um, the best way to do this or the best thing to do. Um, and I'm, but I think we also should be, be um, aware of how behavioral modification, the extents that it, that it can go. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on controlling some of this is I'm going to plug some very important research that's going on right now um, through MAPS, MAPS.org. It's the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. And there's some great work being done right now um, with like psilocybin and uh, LSD, drugs we would normally think of like terrible and bad. Actually, I have been meaning to ask you about psilocybin. I mean, um, Jordan Peterson talks about it also. I think a lot of emphasis, at least in Western world is, um, and I'm being biased here uh, for some reason, um, is uh, focused on um, you know, using drugs to cure things instead of, you know, rooting out the cause of the depression itself and making meaningful life changes. But, but what do we know about um, psilocybin so far? Yeah, so psilocybin has had really positive effects. And I think the key part of this is just exactly as you're saying. It's used more as a tool rather than a cover 
like SS SSRIs are. So SSRIs are something that people have to take again and again, where psilocybin is more or less used as a tool to help people maybe get to certain places they maybe wouldn't otherwise in, in a normal consciousness. And so it helps people get to the root of the problem. Um, and it's something that's non-addictive, non non-habit forming. And so because of that, I think it's a very attractive tool for um, treating things like depression. It's also very good for treating addiction. And again, the key part of it is people can use it once, they can be assisted with it in therapy, and then they don't need to use it again, which I think is like a key point. Like, I, I agree. I don't think we be, should be shoving medicine and pills down people's throats, especially for their entire life. And we should really be focusing on the root of the problem. Are there any clinical trials that have studied uh, the um, negative effects of um, um, psilocybin usage? So the main, the main negative effects, and I think this, these are like the widely known ones, is having uh, like a bad trip or a bad experience on these um, on mushrooms or so, the active ingredient psilocybin. And I think the key part of that is that you're using it in a controlled way, in a controlled area, like set and setting is what people will always talk about. And I think that's such an influ influential part. But when you control that and you have proper set and setting, the negative effects are typically very low and very improbable. Um, but I think the research is still young. Like I think I think we need to be cautious. I think that's, it's a good. Well, you might want to you know have a look at another uh, young research, um, which um, is proposed. Um, and demonstrated um, by our beloved um, Elon Musk um, through a lot of artificial intelligence, and they have demonstrated, you know, they have put um, two of their chips um, in the brains of um, young um, pigs, and you know, they and then you can uh, record the pulses going on in their brain, and you know, their purported, purported um, reason for doing that um, is for people who have spinal injuries and paralysis um, and they would be able to use computer mouse and their um, window their computers through the general impulses um, would you sign up for a cell in your brain <laughs> um, as it stands right now no but uh, okay. in the future probably yes <laughs> how do you I see the research so. Yeah, I think I want to see their research. Yeah, and I think um, I think I'll let the technology develop a little bit more. I kind of like Elon Musk says with with flying to Mars. Like he doesn't want to be the one of the first ones. Like he'll wait for the technology to get better. And I, I'm I'm of the same mind for for Neuralink. I think it's promising technology, but I'd like to see it develop. I I won't be the first person in line. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, that's kind of a uh, pattern for smart people. Last week, Joshua told me that he wouldn't be the first person who would be sitting in a self-driving car um, on an interstate. Um, and I think that's a very good note on which we should end that. We have held you for a long time. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Alex. We have learned so much from your research and your work. Thank you for adding um, to the scientific knowledge that we know of uh, in terms of personality psychology, intelligence, humor, in general and uh, I don't think that I have um, said to you in the beginning because um, is there a rule as to um, how how late it is to say happy new year I mean is it like after fifth you cannot say that or after 10th I should have said, said that no to me there's no rule I think it's more yeah. or less on the basis of when is the last time we talked and has it the new year okay. passed yet? Um, but no, I want to thank you so much for, for having me and talking with you. It's always a pleasure talking with you. We get into such great topics, uh, topics that again, like I said, we, we could talk for hours and hours on this. It's unfortunate to have a cutoff, but no, it's, it it's always enjoyable, always insightful. On that note, high five and I'll see you again. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much everyone for tuning in and we'll talk um, again.